Uh, I'm Pete Thompson um, from uh, Image Holders. I'm the account director. And uh, I've been invited up here this morning to talk to you a little bit about what's happening in the kiosk industry and the self-service industry from our perspective. I suppose to uh, just explain a little bit to qualify why I, I have been invited. I've been produced in, we've been designing and manufacturing kiosks since 2013. Uh, and come very much from a product design background so along the way we had to learn an awful lot about the sort of wider ecosystem and all of the other elements that feed into a good successful self-service uh, solution and so what I'm going to do today is sort of go through how that breaks down and some of the things that you need to consider when uh, looking at creating a successful self-service or kiosk deployment so I think there really is a revolution happening. And what I mean by that is that technology is changing our lives and people are coming up with ever new, new and interesting ways of utilizing it, and particularly within this self-service space. So for example, you know, the way we're paying for goods and services, uh, we're all very familiar now with self-checkout systems, uh, order points in, the, in restaurants, train stations, and so on. Um, the way we move through time and space. Now, it sounds like quite a broad claim, but if you think about it, uh, when you go to the gym and you check in and you pass through the kiosk to get your access control, when you register at the doctor's, when you pop in with your fingerprint and arriving at work, all of these things are using technology, self-service terminals of some format in order to, uh, to track the opposition and, and, and give us access and welcome visitors using digital technology. And then the way we search for and receive information. So in a kiosk, from a kiosk point of view, that could be giving customer feedback at a, at a uh, system or a wayfinding kiosk within a shopping center or a product finder within a, uh, in, a, in a store. There are multiple different ways. So the kiosks, I think we can safely say, are coming. But you know, let's just think, what, what actually is a kiosk? Because that actually means many different things to many different people. There are, I think there's the, pretty much every industry that I can think of are looking at self-service technology in one format or another. And there are multiple different industry sectors and applications, and they're very cross-purpose. So yeah, there's just a few examples of industry sectors where we've all seen examples of self-service application and self-service terminals, but the applications that they're being used for are becoming more and more varied. So it's no longer your traditional, ju yeah, just to kind of pay, pay for something or order something. There's much more than that besides. Uh, I mean, just to put myself on the spot, if there's anybody from any industries here that are not on that list, that maybe I think of a solution that might be suitable for them. Yeah. Banking, Banking yeah. So uh, money transfer kiosks. For example, we've done recently where you're for, for doing international payments, placing a kiosk in a store. And of course, banks are all going down a self-service route, closing branches or pro making them more uh, uh, self-service based. Anyone else? I mean, there really, literally is an, an example for every different industry. So let's think about the case for kiosks a little bit. The big question is, what are you trying to achieve? Now, there are multiple reasons why you might deploy a kiosk. And I would encourage anybody to think about that in, in depth if they're considering a self-service deployment. A few examples here. So, you know, the obvious ones are increasing revenue, perhaps upselling through uh, using good clever software or um, Maybe you want to increase the speed of service or reduce queues at peak times, reallocate uh, staff away from serving customers to uh, maybe you want to take them from behind the counter and put them in front of the counter so they can get a more personal service and therefore increase the, the level of customer service that you're giving. There might be a different type of customer that you're looking to attract. Younger generation are less inclined to want to talk to people. They'd far rather deal with, some, with a machine. Uh, and that's, therefore you're going to get that different kind of customer. And uh, the, one of the big reasons 
might be that you don't actually know who your customers are. So if you are using technology, then there's a very good chance that you can use that to capture information about them. On a personal level, you may want to use a, a loyalty system, for example, which encourages people to enter their details, which allows you to then remarket to them or upsell to them and encourage repeat business. Or even beyond that, technology now was allowing us to use for things like facial recognition to uh, look at the demographic of who's looking at ordering the item. So we might know that it's uh, uh, somebody who's male, 30 to 40, uh, Caucasian, and therefore they are more likely to want to buy this certain type of item. So dynamically, we can change the content that we're displaying on that according to the customer who's there. So technology can really add a lot of value. Some people are simply more comfortable ordering at a machine. And it, there's a lot of reasons, and it, that, you know, there are just a few examples. And uh, that my point is that you really need to consider what the reasons, all of the reasons you might be thinking of before you actually uh, look at deploying something. So there are different things to consider in this. And obviously, the, the, I think probably the most important thing, which quite often does get overlooked, are the people involved in it. So thinking about this in two parts, who are your users? It is incredibly important to understand who's, who your target customer is. And it might be that that could be anybody. And therefore, you've got to be able to uh, create something which is incredibly uh, easy for anybody to use. And the way to do that is to think about the user journey. And the user journey is not just what happens at the kiosk. The user journey, I think about it in terms of the the moment that you walk into the space where that kiosk might be, you, you're starting to think about how they're going to go in there. How do they know that that kiosk is for that particular function? You have to create that. It has to be incredibly intuitive. Even from a distance, we see that and go, ah, that's where I go and place my order. That's where I register. So good branding, good visibility, and it needs to look appealing. It's, if you want people to go and use this thing, let's make it look good and make it attractive to use and invite them. In the other half of this, there are still going, there are staff, there are people working in these places that are need to be uh, engaged with the self-service concept. People might feel threatened by that. You know, the kiosks are taking our jobs. Well, actually, you know, this is an opportunity to redeploy people uh, and to do something perhaps more interesting or to add more value. And I think any of the businesses that are thinking about it in that way are the ones who are going to really achieve by that. And they're going to get the staff to buy into this um, and you know, really kind of uh, embrace this change. One of the ways you might do that is by getting staff on board with the maintenance of the kiosk, you know, explaining how it works, showing them how to do it, give them responsibility for it and make them engaged with that process. Now the other thing, to, the next sort of thing to look at would be the environment that you're going in. And we're talking about the, the user journey a little bit. Um, so I think about this in two parts, really the space that you're going in and then the physical design of the kiosk. So there's no reason why the kiosk should not be considered as part of that space. Think about it in terms of interior design. You know, I think gone are the days where we're going to put a metal box in the corner and think we've got a kiosk there. It has to be integrated and in keeping uh, and we can use a lot of different, think, think a little, a lot of different uh, ways of do, achieving that depending on what you're trying to achieve. So, you know, a few things to talk about are the, um, the ergonomics of it. So, you know, going back to this user journey thing, thinking about the way that people have to stand at the kiosk, where do they put their cards, where do they collect their receipts, is it intuitive to use? Does it have to be self-service? in the world, so you need to, I think you need to be very, very obvious. If it's not aesthetically pleasing, then people are going to be less inclined to use it, like it or not. It's got to look the part. Um, you've got to consider access for every different kind of person, um, regardless of, uh, of ability. And this, this thing I, um, I use a lot when talking to people is how do we make this intuitive to use? Or you've got to know, it's, and that just comes into the, the software, uh, and the hardware combined, the whole thing considered as a, as a whole. These 
often use a range of different materials and finishes uh, to, uh, to, to, to make this uh, part of the space. Uh, what I'm quite often looking at would be somebody putting something into a uh, nice plush reception desk and they've got a big oak desk. Why don't we use an oak finish on the counter as part of the, the deal? So it looks like it's part of the, the furniture, part of the furniture, literally. Uh, you know, so in, we might have space limitations. In TS design, um, we do a lot about giving the, uh, the using the right kind of technology and the right design industry so that you might be able to maximize the number of units within that space. And the image there is actually of a, uh, a betting shop. Um, we deployed into a, a, a thousand betting shops. And, and you'd be familiar with the traditional kind of fruit machine style units. They always go against the wall. They're always in a big row. They're all, and the design hasn't changed in 50 years. Even though the technology that's inside it is completely different. What we did was took a kind of different approach to that and used a sort of much more modular, starting off with tablets actually, and the, the using tablet mounts, and the, actually the screens got bigger over time as they realized that the, the user interface needed to be bigger. So we went up to a 15.6 inch screen. But doing the furniture like it's shown in there had the unintended effect of making the space a much more social space. Instead of everybody standing in a row against the wall, suddenly they were standing in the middle of the room, around tables, interacting with one another in a way that they hadn't done before. And in addition to that, they were able to fit a lot more equipment into the space because it was no longer limited to just sitting against the wall. It could go into the, uh, anywhere within the middle of the floor. We said we drop towers down cubes from the ceiling to make it easy for them to sort of crawl, and all sorts of things like that. Which we had, we used a very sort of modular approach. And I expect to be able to have things the way they want them. So, making having a modular offer means that you can tailor your kiosk to each different customer's needs. Uh, yeah. It's an interesting question, and uh, well, actually, there was obviously quite a few pilots and trials went on before uh, this went through a full rollout, and it did take a while to uh, get people to switch over to it. The big change came when, when we went from a 12-inch tablet to a 15.6-inch, um, because it was to do with the user interface, and the games that were offered on these things were slightly different to the one. They were fixed old sports betting similar, so. They changed it up slightly, so they, they used their, <coughs> their, pro their gambling products to encourage use and get adoption. And it actually went very well, and they're still out there today. So, yeah, it did change it. And the, really, their goal, to be honest, was that there was a limit of space to how many machines they could fit into the, the room. And it was how do we make something using the technology available now to, uh, to overcome this challenge. And they thought it was a little tablet on a mount. Actually, it became much more than that. <laughs> the, con the, uh, the units underneath here, this, we called it a compact terminal, that had a, a cash extractor, a printer, and an NFC reader in inside there. So this is actually, this machine was able to take feed cash. You could, you could get put uh, the cash that you were given an account, so you could access your account through an NFC card. And, you know, this, this and that actually, that brings quite nicely on to the next part of this, which is really the technology that's going to go inside. So, you know, technology, this is a technology product, obviously, and there's a lot to consider here. There are thousands of ISVs producing self-service technology uh, in all different shapes and sizes for every all these different industries and applications that I mentioned. And finding the right software and ma then matching that to compatible devices is, is really the thing that we've become very specialist at, is kind of the top. We've as, as, the, as the sort of hardware guys who put it all together, we have to make sure that whatever software is being used is compatible.
compatible with the, uh, the different devices that are being used, that they all fit together in this uh, unit which is uh, elegant and smart and intuitive to use and ergonomic to use. So you've got all these different factors feeding into it. But those two are the kind of drivers at the, at the outset. You, you need to know what your software is. Your user interface is very key. Yeah, to get a good, it's got to be very obvious to use. But we, and we talk about this, and the user interface is not just the software. The user interface is the whole thing. You know, you're, you're, the kiosk is the interface, and that's just one part of it. We're all mo moving more and more towards mobile technology, and sometimes, you know, that can be considered as a sort of threat to the kiosk industry because you do it all on your mobile phone rather than in the, uh, in the kiosk. But actually, a lot of people are starting to, the journey starts on your phone. So, for example, uh, you might book a gym class on your mobile on your membership app before you even arrive. They know you're coming, but when you arrive, you need to check in at the kiosk, scanning a QR code on your phone, for example. So there's sort of very much an end-to-end -end journey there. Most software is, the trend is to go cloud-based. Um, it offers a lot of advantages in terms of being able to manage your estate remotely, uh, push updates out through automatically to your entire estate, uh, and, and, man and manage it all from a central location. Cloud-based apps are the way forward, although that does present challenges with integrating to uh, devices that are held locally. And you've got um, so there's kind of you, the, the sometimes there's some middleware required in terms of software to integrate the devices locally and match the software, depending on the application. Uh, there's a, a lot of kiosks require payment, and this is the part where a lot of my customers have trouble. Um, they expect us as kiosk providers to be able to offer a turnkey solution, but of course pay the payment industry is a bit of a law unto itself, and the whole software providers will have to have integrated with the uh, different hardware providers, uh, the customer might already have a payment service provider who issue that hardware to them, so we don't necessarily get to dictate what that is and have to be flexible enough to fit whichever devices they want. So it's, kind of, it's quite convoluted, and you have to kind of help people along through that. Um, so there's, uh, there's some challenges involved in, in that side of it. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities presenting themselves with artificial intelligence now and, and you know, big data. And I touched earlier on the, uh, the idea of using uh, facial recognition to recognize the types of customer you are. You might also, <coughs> over, over a wider state, you might gather a, an enormous amount of data about buying trends um, and how they re relate to things such as uh, seasonality, the weather, a trend, uh, trends in happening within retail, and so on. And so you can use that to your advantage to, um, to upsell the kiosk. I mean, I mean, the machine learning and capability and sort of software can actually become incredibly sophisticated. Uh, so it's not just a one-size-fits-all in terms of upselling anymore. It's really uh, can be completely tailored almost uniquely to the individual. Um, there is a big need to look at the sort of maintenance and management of your estate ongoing, and, and that's something that shouldn't be overlooked. Uh, and there are lots of options of, for software and third-party options. Quite a few are here today. Who might do it? Who can help with that? Yeah, I think the, the other sort of element to think about this is um, with a particular application. Uh, so the kiosk in the middle there, I'll, I'll just use that as an example. Um, that's a, uh, it's a medical check-in kiosk. Now they, I'll just give that as a, an example to go through the different things to consider. So that particular client needs to be able to scan a driving license to verify the identification of, their pers of a person <coughs> and an insurance card to, to qualify whether or not they have to pay for their treatment. That has to be linked live to the uh, database that can verify that that driving license is accurate, that the insurance system, the insurance policy is up to date, return and uh, know whether or not they're due to pay or how much. Uh, the camera on top needs to capture the, an image of them so that, that it can record 
who had been there and what the transaction was, which is a sort of manda mandated thing that they have to do, previously done at a reception. If there's payment involved, they have to be able to issue a, and they have to be able to issue a receipt. It has to be uh, ADA approved, so the American Disability Association needs to, to, to sort of comply with all of their regulations. Different customers want to put their own artwork and branding on it, so it's got to be done in a way which makes it very easy to be able to replicate that uh, cost effectively and efficiently. And it's got to be serviced, so it needs good access uh, from, uh, for the, the, the PC internally in, in, inside it. And, it's, and then aesthetically, it had to be on brand and looked apart in, in terms of this particular client, what they consider to be their, their aesthetic and their, their requirements. So there's, there's a whole lot of things to consider, and that's without even looking at the software side of things in too much detail, which they've gone into in great depth. So, let me just finish this turn upside down. So just to kind of summarize there, I said my, my, my takeaway really uh, for this is for a, a self-service peer permission to be effective, uh, you need to think about the complete end-to-end -end ecosystem um, from a, from a pers people's perspective, the design of the unit and the space that it's growing in, and the, and the technology that is uh, Got to be required to make that run effectively. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much for listening. I uh, hope that's been interesting. And just to leave you with the final thing, uh, he says, thank you, Sarah, the key. Thank you very much.